I know. How exciting. A little bit nerve-wracking as well, because it's been a long time since any of us have presented to a larger crowd. <laughs> and we haven't had that safety barrier of, of a computer between us. Um, but I've been looking forward to it, and I've been looking forward to seeing everyone's faces. And how beautiful, I don't know if a lot of you know, but today's the Diwali for Hindus. So it's kind of a, a nice thing that we're starting this off on Diwali. Let the prosperity continue. So. A big question, who am I? What do I want to be when I grow up? Um, how often have you been asked that question as a child where an adult comes up to you and says, who do you want to be when you grow up? And as a six-year-old, an eight-year-old, a 14-year-old, a 16-year-old, what are you supposed to answer to that? I've watched my kids sort of fluster and, and say, well, what? Uh, I want to be an astronaut, I want to be a doctor, I want to be an engineer, I want to be, and changing their minds every five minutes. But the thing is, it's a really important question because it helps them to build identity. So I thought I would start our Wellness Wednesday sessions with this topic, only because I think it actually covers so many different areas of development for a child, for a young man or woman, a young adult. Um, and it kind of touches on all of the different areas that we'll then go deeper into in subsequent Wellness Wednesday sessions. Um, and you know, in terms of how to build up to this. So I know some of you sent across questions and I will answer as many of them as I possibly can. There were quite a number um, towards the end of our session today. And forgive me if I don't get to your question and I'll answer them to the best of my ability. And if you have any questions, um, please feel free to ask them today as well. So I actually chose this because I mean, it's a little bit, okay, morbid, but then it actually fits. So if today was the last day of my life, would I want to do what I am about to do today? And that's actually a question that, that's, you know, that's not just for our children, but even for us as adults, right? It's an everyday question. It's a question you ask yourself as soon as you wake up in the morning. If today were the last day of my life, would I do what I'm about to do today? Would I behave the way I'm about to behave today? Would I make the choices I make today? And it's such an important um, sort of way to start the day because it kind of sets the tone for the rest of the day and how you behave, the choices you make. So today, we're very simple, three sort of um, areas that we're gonna cover. Um, what is purpose and meaning? What does that actually mean? I mean, I know we've heard the word a lot. Um, you know, having purpose in life, being purposeful, having the meaning in life, all of that. Why do our children need to have that? Why do we need to actually inculcate this? Why do we need to, to teach them how to do this from such a young age for the younger ones? And for the older ones, how will it help them? And then finally, how can we help them um, sort of start this pattern in the way they think, in the way they behave, in the way they feel that allows them to recognize meaning or purpose in the things that they do and the choices that they make. And it's, you know, it's sort of um, an over-encompassing system that actually, you know, it, it kind of covers all of the different development stages, it covers all of the different areas of their life. So what is purpose? You know, purpose is something that we, we think of in terms of, oh, this is what I want to do today. So that's my purpose. This is, you know, I, this is what I want to achieve. So that's my purpose. This is the job I want to get. That's my purpose. The thing about purpose is, it's a meaning to self. What does that mean? It actually means that it is, you know, it has meaning to the individual. It's important for that individual. It is a commitment to action. So purpose actually involves commitment. It's not just about finding meaning in, in the thing or in the person, it actually involves being committed to those actions that lead you there as well. It's dynamic and multi-layered. And this is where I think a lot of kids, a lot of young adults and adults get sort of caught up. Because the thing about purpose is it's, it evolves over time. It evolves from, you know, you may have one today, but you may have the next one next year. So it's, it's a dynamic process, and it's, it's very 
Um, it, it evolves over time through your experiences, through the people that you meet, it changes. And if it does that for us as adults, imagine how much more quicker and how much more it's evolving for children and young adults who are developing their identity, who are developing their sense of who they are and, and who are in, in that stage of life where they're facing all of the different choices that they have going forward. So it's really important to, to sort of acknowledge um, at any moment when you're having conversations with, with children that they might have a purpose or something might mean something to them today but that can change over time. And just because, you know, I know, for example, my son, one year he's really into football and that's everything for him. And then the following year he wants tennis. And, you know, in the beginning it was very difficult for me as a mom because I, I kind of thought, well, why isn't he sticking to one thing and getting good at it? And then I realized what he's doing is he's discovering. He's actually trying to figure out what it is that he likes about each of those sports and what he wants to move forward with. And so I actually, that's where my conversation happened with him. It wasn't about, um, you know, you need to stick to one thing and we've invested so much in this one thing. It was more along the lines of, well, why do you want to change? Like, what is it about the other sport that you want to know more about? So those are the kind of, you know, questions. So it's, it's important not to fix them or label the, uh, their choices. Purpose can be or become an internal compass. So, you know, when you have meaning and, and sort of uh, when you have that sense of purpose, it actually allows the, um, the individual's behavior to be directed in a certain way. And, you know, behavior, emotions, attitudes, and thoughts, they're all interrelated. When you change one, you change the other. So when purpose, you know, is present, when it's Purpose is always present. No, let me rephrase that. When purpose is acknowledged, when purpose is identified, then it can become an internal compass for the child. And then finally, it's an intention to contribute. So purpose, yes, purpose um, you know, is related to, it uh, needs commitment, but it also needs intention. And intention is what? It's really another way of describing a sense of motivation. Right, because if you're motive, if you have intention, that's all very well and good. But you don't do anything about it unless you have motivation, um, and that's what purpose helps to build. So purpose, in a sense, I mean, so if you want to think of it as a definition or a description of purpose, yes, it is all of these different things. But what does it do for our children? Purpose builds resourcefulness. It builds a sense of self-belief and self-esteem. Why? Because they actually start to believe in what they can do. And it's, um, it's sort of like a, a loop, right? So when they do something that they're good at, they get positive reinforcement, so they get better at it. So they move on to the next level. So um, how, do you, how do they get good at something? By having it mean something to them. It, it helps them to build persistence. It helps them to build focus and clarity. Um, it motivates them, confidence, tolerance, empathy, all of the good sort of, um, sort of the good stuff, all of the, the positive characteristics that we want to see in our children. Now, the thing about purpose is that it's interesting, those, um, and I'll, well, I guess I'll talk about this after. What purpose also does is it lowers stress and anxiety, and it lowers the uh, sense of low mood or sense of depression. And I generally don't like using that word because it's, it's a very clinical word. Um, it, it lowers any sort of avoidance behaviors, uh, procrastination, avoidance, all of that, and fear and uncertainty. Now, a little bit of research into this. So there's been a number of um, psychologists and scientists who have researched into this, and they've actually found that there are certain things that happen to our bodies when we have purpose, when we have meaning. So for example, in terms of you know, um, the stress and anxiety, purpose, having purpose actually <clears throat> affects the blood flow to the amygdala, which is responsible for regulating fear and uncertainty. And that actually makes a difference because that in itself will build 
on itself to reduce those levels of fear, anxiety, stress, and uncertainty. Purpose also, so uh, Dr. Stretcher, who's from the University of Michigan, has done a tremendous amount of research in this area. And, okay, let me go backwards a bit. The reason I got interested in this whole thing was because, um, you know, I actually looked into it for, for different reasons in terms of why is everyone talking about happiness and joy all of a sudden? Like, how do you find this happiness and joy? There's so much out there, you know, YouTube and Instagram and, and Snapchat and, and all of that on happiness and joy. So how do you actually do it? It's not just the smiley faces. It can't just be about that. So there must be something deeper to it. And that's when I started looking into the, all of the information and the research done on purpose and meaning and, and finding meaning in your life. And I came across Dr. Stretcher from the University of Michigan. And the work that he did and the way he explained it seemed to me the most practical way of approaching this. Um, and you know, I tried out the process myself because I was curious. Um, and it was a very fulfilling, I have to say, satisfying uh, process. So you, you know, it, it does take a bit of self-awareness. So then I went and I used my kids as guinea pigs and I tried it out on them. And I sort of said, okay, let's have these conversations with them. And they're two teenage boys, so it wasn't that easy to get them talking, but I persisted and I, I went through this, this process with them as well. And it helped because I don't know if they found meaning in their life, I and mean, I can't talk for them to that in terms of that, but I know that I started understanding them a lot better. And I started understanding the choices that they're making a lot more clearly. Um, so we were able to have conversations that were a little bit more at the same level or speaking the same language, so to speak, um, which, which definitely helps in you know, being able to guide them through things. So for me, that's why I sort of started on this, um, on looking into it so deeply and putting it together. And I thought it would be nice to be able to share it with, with people. Um, so hence this. So the study that uh, Dr. Stretcher did with his team essentially focused on the uh, prefrontal cortex. So it's called the, um, it's the ventric, yeah, the pre pre prefrontal cortex, sorry. And what they did was they found that when people had purpose and um, meaning in their life, and that, that kind of comes up here. Um, so it's sort of like that, I don't know, we, and we, I'm sure some of you have read about different chakras and energy spots and all of that. Um, and that's one of them as well, coincidentally. And so what they found was that, again, there was an increase of oxygen flow into that area, and that is the area that actually, uh, of your brain, that actually um, stimulates or regulates a sense of happiness and joy and calmness and peace. So there's two things happening then in your body or in your brain when it comes to purpose. Uh, one, the area of your, the part of your brain that actually regulates that sense of calmness, joy, happiness, all of that is being fed with more oxygen, and two, the amygdala, which actually regulates the sense of fear, uncertainty, stress, anxiety, all of those is, um, is actually getting lesser blood flow. So it's interesting that that is happening in combination. And there was, you know, there was more research that was done in terms of um, you know, doing functional MRI studies, and they looked at um, you know, different parts of the brain and, and oxygen flow, and they realized that all of these sort of positive um, characteristics were being reinforced when somebody felt or s felt basically or thought that they had purpose and meaning in their life. So that's a little bit of science behind all of this. So it's something to, to actually think about in terms of how we can move forward. And of course, the, the research is being continued. So finally, how can we help? So I guess this is the entree um, or the main part of the meal, so to speak, in terms of the presentation. So I don't know if you've come across the word ikigai, which is a Japanese term, and they use it um, to actually describe being in a state of being where you have something or someone in your life that has meaning for you. Um, and this is what, according to the Japanese culture, this is what you reach for. 
this is what you, uh, this should be the end goal in the sense. And, you know, the ikigai, according to the Japanese um, sort of process and way of thinking, it, it actually involves all of these different things. So you have passion and, and you have mission and then you have profession and vocation. So there's different areas that must all come together, so to speak, um, to be able to recognize your ikigai, to be able to recognize your purpose or meaning. Um, so this, this is one way of, of doing it. And so the three-step approach that I sort of um, took on board from Dr. Stretcher is, is very simpler. It's a little bit simpler than this. Um, and it's, the first is self-affirmation. What is self-affirmation? It's really about asking the question, who am I? So I know I started off by talking about purpose is all about that question of who am I, but that's only part of it. Um, the question of who am I is only the first step. So we need, the, the point is to help our children understand who they are today. The second part of it are beagles. So then we take that who am I and we start to help them to translate it into who I want to be. And from that, we start to develop action goals with them so that they can actually action who they want to be, thus leading into their purpose. So it's really just three steps. Now, one of the things that I, you know, I always sort of say is purpose isn't, you know, it's the, is it the meaning of life or the meaning in life? You know, so it's, it's a tricky question, but it's a little bit of both, I think, to tell you the truth. It, it is the meaning of life and it is the meaning in life as well. And, you know, there is something that we need to keep in mind when developing purpose or meaning. There's two different ways we can come at it, right? One is coming at it from a hedonistic position, which means what? All about my own pleasure, all about something for me. The, the key about purpose and meaning that will lead to all of those positives and happiness and joy is to come at it from a transcendent point of view, which is what can I do for the community? What is it that can give that has meaning to me that is my purpose that will allow me to contribute to the people around me. And what does community mean? It doesn't have to be the whole of Dubai or the whole of the world, no. It can mean as something you know, meaningful as your family. It can, it can, that could be the community that you would like to contribute towards. It could be their siblings. It could be their peers or their friendship groups. So it really is about focusing on the transcendent, um, transcendent ideas that come through from this. So that is a question that needs to be asked throughout the process when you're having conversations with your children. It's about, okay, is this only for you, but how, can, how do you think this can help person A, person B, person C, or maybe even their pets, I don't know. It could be anyone, but something else outside of them, right, which is really important. Am I going too fast, or is this okay? All right. <laughs> All right, so, self-affirmation. Now, how do I want to be known is the ultimate question. And again, this is something I think we all come across, and I tend to, you know, the original question on this is, you know, what does my, what do I want my eulogy to say? What do I want, you know, those kind of things, which I don't, you know, I, I don't really like using that with children, I don't think it's appropriate at all. Um, so I, I rephrased it to this. Um, so I think it's important because it's evolutionary, evolving, because it's such a dynamic process, it's important to ask this question of them. How do I want to be known? How do you want to be known? Like what do you want people to, to know you as? Like your reputation, and that's a big deal for young adults. And the, even the younger children today, right? Because they, they're all, they all have the social media presence. So what is it that they're trying to project on their social media presence? Like what, what kind of image? What is it that they want to, um, to be known for, known as, as well? And talking about it in that manner with them is, is actually really helpful because it allows them to relate to your words. Um, so it's, for them, it's not about how do I want to be known 
in the adult groups, they don't care. They don't care how your, you know, their parents' friends know them. They don't care how um, even their their teachers or or any of the adults in their lives really know them. You know, they have a different persona for that. Their concern is how do I, how am I known within my friends' group? How am I known on my social media accounts? What is it that my reputation is like? What is my presence? What is my facade persona? What do they call me? So what I did, or what Dr. Stretcher did, and I kind of expanded on it, is I, these are some of the questions that we can ask. This is where the conversation starts. Now keep in mind, this conversation is not, so wait, this isn't the whole slide. As soon as, okay, let me just, go ahead. <laughs> now you can. Um, okay, so this conversation, keep in mind, is something with the younger children, with the younger children, you have it, you know, you can have it more pointed. Um, you can actually ask the questions and have conversations around the questions, um, and they will, they will respond. You know, they tend to like actually connect more and they respond more. For the, the teenagers and the older children, it's a little bit more difficult to have these conversations. Um, sometimes it's literally like, you know, I feel personally, it's like pulling teeth out of mouth. Uh, with a pair of clippers, it's impossible to do it. So with them, it's important to remember that you don't have to have the entire conversation in one shot. This is a process and it has to happen slowly and it has to happen in a way where they can relate and they don't feel like you're interrogating them because that's not the point of the, the, uh, the exercise, right? The point is to actually support them, help them guide themselves in a way. Um, and help them come to these realizations on their own. And that actually gives them a sense of self-respect when we do that with them, because we're giving them autonomy. We're telling them that, yes, your answers can be anything. I don't need to dictate your answers as a parent. So who am I at my best is, is an important question, and what do I value is important. So what matters most, who relies on me, and all of those are also important, but they're what I call the supporting cast. Um, so those are supporting questions that you add on and you ask. So, you know, if the conversations need to be short, they need to be frequent, and they need to be accepting, which means they need to be non-judgmental. Um, and I know sometimes that's really difficult because, you know, at the end of the day, as parents, you want to protect your child. You want to actually make sure that they're making the right decisions. So our instinct is always to guide them. And you know, that's, it's always sort of to give advice and to guide them and to make sure that they take the right path. But one more thing that's important to remember, and, and you know, from a counseling perspective, from a psychology perspective, is that acceptance, you know, once you start to sort of lay off on that aspect of it and start to say, okay, fine, I'm just here to listen, a lot more information tends to come out and sometimes you, you sort of discover that there is meaning behind what they're saying. They might not be expressing it clearly um, until you gave them that space to do so. So this is one thing um, that I, you know, I think is really important in having the conversation. And finally, the smartphone. And why do I put that there? It's a cheat sheet of purpose in our kids' lives. It's really interesting. So, one of the ways Dr. Strachter, um sort of did this is, you know, a lot of times it's tough to have these conversations with children. Like, you know, when you start to talk to them about, you know, what is it that you value the most in your life? Um, who do you think you are at your best? They don't know how to answer these questions. You know, it's, and sometimes, you know, even as adults, to tell you the truth, even us as adults, if somebody came up to us and asked us these questions, we'd really have to think through it. Um, and it takes a, a lot of self-awareness sometimes to be able to answer these questions truthfully enough to get to a meaningful response or an answer. So, what do we do? The smartphone. We use these things as literal records of our lives today. Everything we do, say, has meaning in our life that's important to us is on this piece of technology. And it's the same for our children. They take pictures, they post them on, on social media, they have conversations about certain things, they follow certain groups, they, you know, everything that is important to them is on this phone. So, 
One of the ways to actually approach it is to say, all right, let's play a game. We take out our phones, and I'll do this with you. Let's, let's look at who am I at my best, and let's look at all of those really happy pictures that you have that you feel like you're, you know, wh which pictures that you feel were the best moments of your life. Like, what were you, who were you then? What were you doing? And start to list those things out. You know, things like, what do I value the most? You know, what are the, the, uh, the accounts that they follow? What are the interests that they follow? What are the causes that they're following? Um, what are the, you know, are they, uh, is there like, a, you know, a tremendous number of pictures of pets and animals? Is, is it nature? Is it uh, people doing funny things? Is it magic tricks that they're watching over and over again? Is it, you know, I, it could be anything. Are they games that they're playing on their phone or on their devices that they're playing over and over again? And I'll come back to the whole gaming thing and how we actually deal with that and this question as well in a second. Um, so it's, it's important to actually do that little bit of discovery. And you know what, in all honesty, they might not want to show you everything because they have their own level of privacy and that's fair enough. They, they are owed that, they are, you know, everyone has, um, that's something that everyone has a right to. But so it's not, it's not that they need to tell you. For the older ones, it's not that they need to come out and say to you, oh, this is what I'm doing, this is what I'm following, and da, da, da. that's not the point of the exercise. The point of the exercise is to guide them. So even if they're not showing it to you, um, as long as you're going through the exercise with them and having conversations with them, where they're not telling you, oh, I follow this, this, and this, but you're actually saying, well, look at what you're following. Like, do you think there's anything in there and those accounts that you, know, you do the most, that you find yourself visiting that site the most, that you find yourself interacting with that, um, whatever, YouTuber or it, whoever, whatever, the, those people who make those videos the most. And why is it that you're doing that the most? So, you know, it's, I guess in that way, the smartphone is, is a positive because it allows us to have that record of our behaviors and our interests. Uh, and you know what, why not use it? It's there. So then the next part of that, and to dive a little bit deeper, is who am I at my best? Now, what are some of the things that they might say to you? You know, are they kind? Are they courageous at their best? Um, are they connecting with their friends at their best? Are they um, empathetic at their best? Are they very sensitive? Are they, when they're at their best, are they the kind of friend or sibling who listens, who talks, and who actually gives advice to other people? When they're at their best, are they fearless? Are they courageous? Are they the kind of person who loves to try new things? Um, when they're at their best, it, do they have full clarity of mind and are they able to, to sort of you know, play a game of chess like five steps ahead of their partner they're playing with? When they're at their best, like, so what is it? When they're at their best, are they gaming and they're you know, 10 moves ahead of the, the people that they're playing with on the game and they're about you know, able to strategically maneuver themselves really well. So what is it, who are they at their best? Like how would they define themselves? And again, this is important because it's important to give them an idea of what this means, right? So use the words. So one way of doing it, as I said, is to do it yourself, to go through this process yourself so that it, you can show them how to do, what the thinking around it is, what are the words to use as well uh, when they're describing themselves in these ways. Okay, the second question that I said is, is important is, what do I value? <clears throat> so what is it that they value? Do they value people? Um, is it experiences on that phone that they're valuing? Um, is it a wish list? Do they have like a bucket list of things that they want to do like things that they want to try that are, that are outside of their current world, things that they want to experience that are new to them. So is that what it is that they keep going back towards, this wish list of things that they want to do? So it's really important to, to sort of, you know, find out from them what is, are, are people connecting, conversations, all of these things around that, is that what's, you know, kind of, Get, getting them going, getting them out of bed in the morning. Um, do they look forward to it because of the experiences they have? Do they look forward to getting out of bed in the morning because of the people that they'll see? Is it because 
they um, are going to be able to achieve something that you know that they know that they're good at. Like, what is it that they want to um, that they value the most? So, you know, I kind of put some some examples just because I thought it would be easier to to really you know understand where I'm getting at with this. Getting top results, you know, some kids might come back and say, well, I really just need to do really well in my, my exams. I need to do well in school and I need to perform well. So whether it's school, whether it's playing the piano, whether it's at tennis or uh, I don't know, basketball or art, whatever it is. Maybe, maybe your child or yourself, maybe it's, you know, documentaries like nature documentaries that they constantly are watching um, on YouTube, that they're constantly sort of uh, repeat it, repeat watching or looking for. Maybe it's something to do with sports. Maybe they follow all of the sports teams. Maybe they have favorite sports teams. There's specific types of sports as well that they're following. Artwork, maybe they, you know, they're completely in love with anything to do with art, uh, dance, music, any of that. Family pictures, maybe your son or daughter has a whole bunch of different family pictures that they cherish and they keep, they keep going back towards holiday pictures, you know, that they took of their friends and their family that they constantly are revisiting on their phone. Um, maybe one of them follows the news channels, you know, what's happening in the world. Maybe that's important to them to be able to be up to date on what's going on in the world. Maybe it's a specific type of news as well. Maybe it's about climate change or maybe it's about a specific country that they're following um, and what's happening there. It could be jokes, it could be magic tricks, um, it could be new inventions, latest models of cars, watches, you know, any of these things that they're constantly trying to keep up to date with. It could be games. And the games, does, of course, don't stop at the phone. They also, you know, they, they involve the larger devices as well. And yes, it could be games. Gaming is such a big part of our kids' lives nowadays, and we can't ignore it, and we can't block it, because that's not gonna work. So why not understand it instead? Why not see what is it about this that has got hold of, of the young adults nowadays to such an extent that they're really invested in it? Okay, I wanted to know. So I actually looked into it and I started talking about it with my children. And you know, it was interesting because in the beginning they were trying to describe all the different games and I couldn't make head or tail of it because I could not understand for the life of me what it is they were trying to play. But then, as we dug deeper into it, it was, you know, they started talking about things like, yeah, but you know, if we follow that strategy, then that wouldn't work. But then if we follow this strategy, this would work. And then they started talking about, yeah, but, you know, these many people on a team doesn't make sense organizationally because these people, you know, two or three of these people don't really do anything. It's these people that are actually doing all the work. So it occurred to me that in this process of gaming, which yes, has all its negativity as well, and it, there always has to be a balance, there was also something else happening in terms of what they were learning. And <clears throat> it was important for me to be able to identify that with them. Um, to be able to balance that negative aspect of gaming that seems to come out. So games are a conversation that we can actually have a deeper look into when it comes to these questions, um, simply by trying to understand what it is, what exactly is it? Like one of the kids that I talked to um, actually told me he game, he, you know, he tends to play a lot of different games online and he's like, yeah, but the thing is I only do history ones. I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, I love history. So I do all of these games on history and I'm learning a lot about different periods of life in different countries. I'm like, huh, okay, I didn't realize that there were games like that, but okay. So that's, you know, that was his interest. Um, so it's not something, you know, that we should sort of reject. So what matters most, who relies on me? So what matters most? So once you've, you know, got the big questions of who am I at my best and what do I value? The next set of questions that kind of help to discover the, the intricacies within people, experiences, and wish list is what matters most? Um, who relies on me? So that's an important question to have. And as children, maybe the first answer that you'll get out of them is nobody, nobody relies on me, I'm a child. Like, I, I don't have any power. But that's not true. Because there are, you know, for example, it could be pets, that they're, you know, part of their chores could be to 
take their dog for a walk and that dog relies on them because if that dog doesn't go for a walk then that could be dangerous for that pet it could be um, you know cleaning up the kitty litter for a cat it could be maybe it could be helping mom set the table every day and you know even if that's a five minute job that's five minutes that mom is relying on that child um, it could be anything so there's so many different small things that children do um, that actually you can let them know that they are relied upon and that's important for them to know because it helps them to build that sense of self-belief the sense of self-esteem um, also that they're there you know they're part of something that they are actually important to a bigger picture as well um, what inspires me who inspires me and that's Again, that's an easy one for them because I'm sure they have a whole list of them. But the question that accompanies that is why? Like what is it about that individual or that thing that inspires you? Um, does it make you excited? Does it make you look forward to something? Does it make you feel that you want to do those things? Like what is it? Is it the experience of it? Um, and again, you know, I repeat, when ans asking these questions, or it should be a discussion, it shouldn't be an asking of questions, um, it's important to be accepting, right? So they might not say Nelson Mandela, and they might not say Gandhi, but they might say, who's the, I don't know who the latest is, Ariana Grande, or whoever it is, right? Who is the newest or latest um, person out there? Billie Eilish, like all of these people. And that's okay. It's okay that it's those people. The question is, why? What has that person done that inspires you? Is it because they're singing? Is it because they made it and they were successful? Is it because they work really hard at what they do? Is it, is it because they party really hard? And that could be it. It could be as simple as that. They get to hang out with their friends and they're always having fun. Okay, so fun is an important thing for your child. That's not a wrong thing. It's something we can build on, right? So, how can we help? So this is the next step, the beagles. Um, this is where you start to help them to frame their purpose, the statement of purpose, right? So I want to be a grade A student. So I want to be a good student. What does that mean? I want to be a grade A student. Um, you see that they have a lot of pictures of animals and nature. I want to be, I want to help people or animals. Um, I want to be a scientist. If you have a child who's watching a lot of documentaries or you know things about innovation or anything to do with like building something, um, I want to be a scientist. A child who's watching a lot of a particular type of sport, I want to be a footballer. Or you know a child who's really focused on art and and nature or art and music or anything to do with like some sort of creativity. Um, you know, images of waterfalls, that kind of thing. I want to seek beauty. Um, I want to be an artist. I want to be a visionary. It could be a child who's, you know, focused on uh, different innovative technologies, um, anything that is going to make life easier, anything like AI, any of that. <clears throat> it could translate to, so a child who's got a lot of friends, pictures of friends, hanging out with friends, doing things to friends. I want to be a good friend. You know, it could be as simple as that. I want to show people new things. A child who's got uh, tons of videos that they watch, which is all about like people making jokes and these funny videos and all of that. I want to be funny. You know, that, that could be something that has meaning for them. Um, I want to be with my family. A child who's got, you know, we're all expats here and we all have extended families that live away from us. And, you know, it could be like over the last two years especially, that your child is really focused on your extended family members and, and tends to focus on pictures of them and holidays that you had together with them. I want to be with my family. Um, a child who plays a lot of games, again, I come back to the gaming, because that, and research has actually shown this, it's very strongly tied to strategic thinking. Um, I want to be a strategic thinker. I want to be an inventor of technology. I mean, you know, I know that there are children who are so focused and we see them sitting in front of their devices constantly, but when you start to question what they're doing in those, with those devices, you kind of start to understand that it takes that much time for someone to understand coding. Because I wouldn't be able to do it in half an hour, which is sometimes the limit that we give, or an hour, 
that we give our children on their devices. It sometimes takes a bit of research. Um, and you know, that's, that's, that could be um, a beagle for them. I want to be a technology, an inventor of technology. So this then gets translated into, you know, it's a very simple statement. It doesn't have to be complicated. It doesn't have to be over the top. It doesn't have to like sort of say that they're going to be this forever and there's no commitment. As I said, it's a dynamic uh, flow, flow of um, process. So I want to be a family person who is a good friend. I want to help make people feel better about themselves. I want to build new inventions in technology and I want to be able to help the future to maintain its natural beauty. And you put it together. It's, it's a very simple process, too simple. But we just, we don't do it, which is you know, surprising, because it takes self-awareness. It takes a bit of pushing. And it's not something that's going to happen in your first conversation. It's not even going to be, it's not even something that you might think happens in your second conversation. It's something that happens over time as you have these conversations with them. But the point of it is, there is a method to it, to the process, right? So if you, there are certain questions that you can actually use to elicit the responses in order to build these kind of statements. So finally, what do we do with the beagles? We action them. So how do we action them? We have the be and then we have the do, which is, you know, your be is your, your purpose, your um, sort of sense of who you want to be, your do goals, um, and your action goals are what take it to the third step, which really means it's about how do you put that in place? Not for today, maybe, maybe for tomorrow, maybe for the next year. So if you have something like, I wanna be a scientist or I wanna be a friend, what are some of the things that you need to do to be able to do that? You need to be curious, you need to be empathetic, you need to be innovative, a listener. If you wanna be a strategic thinker, you need to be a broad thinker. You need to, to connect and you need to have energy, but you also need to stay calm if you want to be, uh, be with your family and you want to show people new things. You need patience. So you need to do these things to be able to be those things. And finally, how do you action that? So if, you're, you know, if you wanna be curious, if you wanna be, um, you know, if you wanna be a scientist, if you want to show people new things, you need to read, learn, study, research. That needs to happen. Um, you know, if you want to be a good listener, you need to use the no interruption game. What does that mean? It's, the, uh, it's literally listening without interrupting when someone else is speaking. Because what we tend to do when other people are speaking is we're already thinking of our response, right, in our head, which means we miss out on nearly 70 to 80% of what the other individual is saying because we're not paying attention to their entire, you know, the body language, their tone of voice, their, the way, what they're saying from some of the content. So the no interruption game is really about playing a game with yourself that says, well, I'm gonna listen. So researching, asking questions. You know, if you, wanna, if you want to learn, if you want to be a broad thinker, you need to ask questions. If you wanna feel, if you wanna be connected, um, if you want to, to be with your family, you need to meet people. Um, you know, if you want to be calm or energetic, you need to be able to sleep and exercise in a hel and eat in a healthy way. And then, you know, using relaxation techniques, using time management to be able to do all of these things that you want to do. If you want to be a strategic thinker, then you need to be able to put into practice time management. So, at the end, this is what we end up with, the actions, and this is where we start. And What's really important is that, you know, little things like, you know, you need to learn to read, study, to time manage. These are things that we tell our children all the time, yes. And we expect them to just sort of follow it, right? We say, oh, you need to do this, that's why you're here. I mean, we're all um, here to support your education, you need to learn, study, and that's how you'll get ahead in life. It's really about linking it backwards to them and to say to them, well, yeah, I mean, I can tell you to read, learn, and study, but it's not gonna have any meaning for you. However, you told me that you wanted to be this, and I don't know how else, you, how else do you think you can be that if you don't do this. And it's about making them understand that that's a choice that they're making. 
they're invested in it. And that's what gives it meaning, and that's what makes them actually do those things and stick to them as well. And that's where the motivation comes in. So these are, you know, it's, as I said, these are conversations that have to happen frequently over time. It's not something that happens overnight. It's not something that can be done within one session with the child. It's really, a, um, it's a dynamic process, and I keep repeating that, that you know, happens through different conversations. And finally, you know, just in terms of a guide when you have the conversations with them, um, act but tread lightly. What does that mean? It means, again, no judgment. It's about accepting what they are saying. Even if it's something that you're not familiar with, if you're not, if, even if it's something you don't agree with, especially if it's something you don't agree with, because at that point, what, you need to, what we need to do is we need to find out why they're saying what they're saying. Why is it so important to them that what is it that we're not seeing? Where's the link? You know, what is it that they have managed to figure out and link together to make it acceptable to them but we are not seeing because it's not acceptable to us. And you know, at the end of the day, to tell you the truth, our children, I think, have it a lot tougher than we ever did, simply because they have a lot more choices. The world is, is more open to them. You know, there's, globalization has just gone to a different level since our generation. And for them, they have everything at their fingertips because of technology knowledge, information, people, connection, everything. So their, their lives in that sense are a lot more challenging. They're facing a lot more challenges than we are in terms of being able to make choices. Discuss what, it, what, what meaning and purpose work, whatever it is, has for you. And that's, again, it's about sharing. So this isn't a conversation just for them and only for them. It's a conversation for everyone. Right? Finding purpose and meaning. So it doesn't, it's something that we can model for them as well. Um, it's something that we can go through as a process for ourselves as well. Um, and then ask thoughtful questions and listen, fine. It's important to have that regular dialogue. And again, it's about expectations, right? When we start these conversations, a lot of times we expect that the conversation will have some sense of closure right then and there, that there will be some sort of an outcome from the conversation. And the thing about it is sometimes the outcomes are not explicit. They are internal. And they might not be always verbalized in that moment. So it's OK to leave a conversation open and then come back to it over time and sort of you know, come back and discuss it. It actually helps because in this particular process, it helps the child to start to think through things as well of what they've said. And they might actually come back with a different answer even the next time around you talk to them. So it's important to open up a regular dialogue with them. Get on board with their interests, which is a, always a plus. Um, so I mean, it's always nice as a child for a parent to ask questions about what they're doing, um, again, without judgment. So you know, how do you do it? What do you do? How do you actually you know, play this game? Can I play one with you? Um, how do you, whatever it is, like what is it that you're learning right now um, in science? What is it that you're learning in math? And I know we do that, and we do that, and again, parents tend to do that a lot in terms of being able to monitor how their level of studying, are they studying enough, are they getting enough good grades? But what about also doing it just in terms of like, I'm really actually interested in what registered with you in that class. Like what is it about psychology that you like? Um, you know, not the data, not the studies, not the research, but is there any particular area that you're interested in? So that kind of thing. And, you know, it, we, because of life and because of responsibilities, we tend to have free, less frequent um, conversations in that manner than I guess maybe should happen um, because they take longer, right? They take longer and they, you need more of an effort to have those kind of conversations. Um, and it's important to encourage them in what they believe matters to them. So whatever it is that has meaning for them. So the process is about them. The meaning and the purpose is for them. 
Um, and we have our own, you know, each of us individually has our own purpose and we have our own um, set of things that have meaning for us. So this is theirs, uniquely theirs. So this is the end of the slides that I have. And these are some of the questions that came through. Um, but before we get to these, do you guys have any questions? Yes, okay, um, I love that you asked that question. So we did that already last year, um, and we did it with the year nines who are at that stage where they're about to be choosing their options for GCSEs, and we thought it would be an appropriate um, time for them to go through this process. And they did it with, uh, they did it over a six week period last year, um, and they went through the entire process, and we're doing that this year as well. So, yeah, we are. Okay. Actually, uh, if the purpose exists and uh, everything is in place, because what you're talking about for me is something like really ideal. We cannot just implement it in our daily life easily, especially with teenagers. It's very hard to let them talk, yeah. to let them come out from their comfort zone and so on. So if they really have, like my son, he has a very clear purpose. But there is no commitment, uh, there is no motivation even to, to just reach his goal, but he's just declaring his goal on a daily basis. I want to be like that. So it's something really, uh, with your presentation, I'm not able to just put it together. Sure. Yeah. And, and that's actually really common, right? I mean, it's common across the board. It's not something that is not, you know, and it happens because you know, this is the stage up until children are about, what is it, 17 or so, is when they're developing still their sense of identity, the sense of who they are. So they're trying out a lot of different things in terms of I want to be. And that's why I keep saying it's a dynamic thing. It evolves over time, right? The question here isn't about, okay, fine, I want to be this today and I want to be that today, but then it's really about why. Like, what is it that's important to you in being that? What is it that you value about being that? That, you know, it's about building that sense of um, investment for him. So he's invested in being that, who, that goal, right? Um, and being able to achieve it. So then it's the next step of actually having that conversation. I know it's not easy to have conversations with teenagers. I get that. It's not, as I said, it's not something that'll happen in one conversation or two conversations. It happens over time. And it's about little, little, it's, it's, like, it's a little bit like sowing seeds, right? So you gotta like plant these little seeds and questions and discussions with them over time across the way. So it's really about investing um, a lot of our effort and time as well into making sure that we remember, oh, okay, fine, he said he wants to be that. And then you notice, you know, you go out somewhere and you see something in a shop or what have you, and it clicks and you come back and say, hey, listen, you said you were interested in that, you wanted to be that. I happen to notice that in that shop. Do you want to go and see if, if you want to do something, you know, if you want to go visit it or you want to go check it out? Says no, then the next step is, oh, okay, so you're not really interested in it? Like, why, what happened? So it's really about those discovery questions. This is a very, as I said, it's a very simplistic process. There's a lot more to it once you get into the conversations, right? But every conversation will flow according to the child and according to the parent and according to the, com the communication styles you have with one another. I know I didn't really fully answer your question, I can't because it is a conversation that you have to have with your son, but it's, it, it's just a structure to follow. Well, the thing about it is, and the way I look at it, is um, they never stopped, right? The 
children never actually stopped being part of the larger world like the adults did because they found other, and they're so resilient, and they found other ways to connect. They found ways to connect using technology. So it's not that they stopped, that it's just that he found a different way of actualizing his interests and his... But also, I have teenagers. Uh, how they communicate uh, virtually and how they communicate when they meet somebody is totally different. Yeah. So I think they're, they're a bit lost now. Because they lost this, you know, when they see each other, their communication is, is so different than what they do online. So they, they actually don't know how to communicate. Uh, there is a bit of that. I, I don't disagree and with they, you. They do still start the day with that later on. So uh, uh, it's, it's been very difficult for them. There is so a little bit of that. This, you know, they missed one or maybe a couple of steps in those stages. And, and it's. Yeah. No, there are, for some of the, for some students and for some children, yes, there is a little bit of that where unfortunately the last two years has been a little, has been, um, has caused them to, when it comes to making connections and when it comes to, to forming, um, understanding different societal rules, um, they missed those years, right? Because we did, we did, we were all together. But having said that, I'm not, and the reason I said what I did earlier is because it's not a situation where all is lost, right? There is, there are ways that they did find to be able to, to make up for it. Not ideal, I get that. Um, and fortunately, you know, hopefully we're, we're coming back to a more, what we, I guess, uh, think of as a normal way of living. So it, it will get better in that sense where they get used to it again. But you know, at the end of the day, as human beings, forming connections is always a very, very big part of our needs. And that's something that will come out um, as, you know, even for, especially for teenagers. Um, forming connections is, is a part of who they are, is a part of their self-identity as well. Because it, you know, they're very much dependent on what other people think of them to, to help them with that sense of identity. So, yeah. Seema, um, I have yet to, uh, I work a lot with a lot of new parents um, at school, and the one common thread that I often find is that they say that my child is not connecting with me yet. Mm. Um, and I, it leads directly into what you said now. So my child is not connecting, my new child is not connecting with peers. How do we help our children to the depth that we see at home um, to bring that in? I mean, we're all, we're all not exactly the same. We all kind of have our representatives coming out when we're in the social environment, right? But um, how do we help them to, to connect with their peers on that? Because it's very guarded, and the information that they put out about themselves are very guarded. And all the children, well, not all the children, um, the children feel that way. Yeah. Um, and the thing is, it's two different, I mean, you sort of said it yourself in the sense that there are two different personas happening here, right? What you're looking at is comfort level. Um, the, the sense of comfort or the level of comfort that they feel at home with their family, with people they've known all their lives is going to be very different. Um, and even when they meet new people, when they are with those people, they will interact in a, in a much more familiar, comfortable way. Um, as opposed to putting them in a situation where they're new, they're new to a school, they're new to um, an environment, um, or even returning to an environment where they have friends, but they haven't seen them in years, or in, in a year, sorry. And, you know, and again, we're talking about a developmental stage where they're all physically changing as well. So they're returning to see friends who don't look the way they remembered, even, um, to a certain extent. So it does take time. And uh, there's no simple answer to your question. It's about time. It's about allowing them the freedom to have that time to get to regain that sense of comfort and control. Um, now keep in mind, when they came back into the school environment, it wasn't to a free school environment. We were still all bubbling up, and we were still masked up. And there was a whole bunch of different procedures and processes that they had to go through that they'd never been through before in a school environment. You know, there was still that fear. You know, the pandemic has hit in so many different ways from a mental health perspective that 
we're not even, we're just now starting to realize the impact that it's had, um, not just on adults, but also, you know, most importantly, on, on our youth um, in terms of mental health and, and how they prepare themselves to face the world. So again, to answer your question, it's time. Um, it's about having time and patience. It's about not pushing them as well, right? That's, that's the important part of it. It's about actually being able to have conversations with them about what it is that is causing them that sense of uh, discomfort or even causing them to sort of stand apart. What is it that they're expecting to happen? Um, are they waiting for the other shoe to drop? Like, what, what does that mean to them? You know, what is that other shoe that they're waiting to, you know, that they think will drop? Um, so there is, a, you know, the, unfortunately, things like fear and uncertainty are learned emotions. They're learned reactions. They are things that we learn over time. And unfortunately, these children have been through an experience recently where they've had to learn fear and uncertainty. Um, so this is what they're dealing with. And to be able to help them manage that and deal with it takes time, takes patience, takes listening, acceptance of what it is that is troubling them, because to them it's important, um, even if it isn't maybe so much to us. Yeah? Uh, I'm sorry, again, I have a sure. question. So I would like to know here, uh, what is the school is going to do in, in such situation now? Returning back to normal or also? This is a question you need to, yeah, so this is yeah. a question you need to ask. Um, a uh, different yeah. set of people from me because yeah. <laughs> you're talking but about the you, procedures. You, you, may, you can maybe take this question to different settings of people, but the thing is that psychology-wise, to let them return back to normal in an from a transition. From a mental health perspective, yes. uh, you know, we do a lot of work in terms of assemblies and, and in terms of just being able to provide support. Um, and that's not just from me, right? Yes. The entire staff is involved in this. Um, there's a pastoral team that oversees it and, and sort of overviews it. We're very conscious of the fact that for teenagers, young adults, and the younger children, this is a large step for them. So we are conscious of that, and we make sure that we're there for them um, to be able to talk, to be able to listen to them talk, um, to be able to, to guide them sometimes. Um, and you know, sometimes that's all they, they need. They just need a, an ear to listen as well. So in, from a mental health perspective, yes. That's something that um, the school and all of the staff, everyone, um, you know, not everyone literally, is very aware of the fact that that is something that we're there for to help support them. Both parties need to work together and so can Of course, and that's, that's always, yeah, that's always the case. Um, okay, so just, I'm just gonna do a couple questions here and then that's it. And I see Dr. Hopkin has joined us as well. <laughs> um, okay, how much is too much sharing? Interesting question. Um, I think that that really is about appropriateness um, and it's about understanding uh, what your child can understand as well. So, you know, there are some things that obviously will cause them to worry um, and some things that will cause them or will sort of elicit fear or uncertainty as well. Um, it's really, the way I look at it is it's not about too much sharing. It's the way a person shares, right? It's the language that we use. Um, and it's about transparency. So it's really about making sure that your child understands what it is that you're talking about. So it's not about you saying something and then them hearing something else. So that conversation sometimes when you're discussing these sort of important topics with children is really about getting their feedback and asking them, so what do you understand from what I said? Like, what do you think? Um, so it's really about asking them those questions when you're having conversations with them and making sure that they've actually understood what it is that you're trying to say. So I don't know if I answered the question exactly, but to me it's really about the way the communication is, is done. How to approach your child when they have seen someone go through difficult times and make a few poor decisions. Again, um, difficult conversations to have with children and not so easy um, when you're trying to get through to them in terms of pointing out right from wrong. But it's, it's again, I think here it's about discussing it 
without judgment. It's about acceptance to a great extent um, and asking them their points of view on the situation and what they feel and what they think about that situation and what has happened, what they've observed as well in terms of the, the individual's behavior. Um, you know, that's important because you want to know what it is your child observes. You want to know what it is that they're noticing um, about uh, negative behaviors. What is, it, what is it that they've picked up? Have they picked up a reason? Have they, you know, is your child sensitive that they've picked up the underlying issue and situation already regarding the negative behavior? Or are they just seeing the negative behavior as something on the surface and as superficial? So again, a deeper conversation around those um, points is important just to be able to understand what, how it's impacting or affecting your child. And finally, I'm just gonna do one more question here. Um, how can parents manage boundaries, te technology time limits without offending teenagers or invading their privacy? Um, that's, like the, uh, that's like the foremost priority question, I think, in all our lives right now. How do we actually get them to stop going on those devices? Um, and again, I think it's about understanding why they're going on those de devices. Yes, balance is always, you know, balance is always a good thing. Of course it is. Um, and it's important to get an agreement about the amount of time that they would need to be on those devices, depending on what it is that they're doing on those devices. As I said, if they're just playing online games, that's one thing. But if they're actually doing things like coding and researching and, and trying to build something, then that's a whole different ballgame. So it's about understanding why they're on their devices, what is it that they're actually doing. So asking those questions and showing interest, but without judgment, that's the key. It's about showing them that they sincerely are interested in what it is that they're doing, even if it's playing a game. What is it about the game that they're playing? So if it's a game and it's about history or strategic thinking or any of these things, then why not give them an alternative as well? Why not say, ah, oh, that's like an awesome skill that you're learning there, so let's see if we can, would you, do you want to actually use that and see what happens when you play chess? Um, how about trying that? Like, do you want to play a game with me? Or let's play Risk. It's a board game. It's an old board game that we used to play, but it might work. But it's also about making those experiences positive, right? Um, it's about making those alternative experiences a positive thing for them that they might want to do. So it has to be of interest to them. Um, so it's, it's a little bit of digging. Um, it's not something that happens overnight. It's not something that you can assume. And that's the key part to it. It's about actually digging to find out what it is, it is about why they're on technology um, and what it is that they're doing on it. And then agreeing with them on boundaries. So it's not about setting boundaries and limits. It's about agreeing with them on the boundaries that are acceptable to both. So it's a bit of a negotiation. And in all honesty, it doesn't matter how young the child is, that is um, that is a much more acceptable way for them to be able to, to invest in that behavior. So I'm going to stop, um, and I'm going to, would you like to say a few words? Pass the mic to Dr. Hopkin, and in the meantime, thank you all very much. And if you have questions, then you know how to reach me. Thank you very much, Priya. Uh, there's nothing more important than well-being. Nothing more important than that. Um, obviously my job is all about A stars and uh, grade nines and all of that shenanigans. But the truth of the matter is that what we're doing is nurturing children and uh, hoping to give them the skills to live the best possible life that they can lead. And that's so much more than academics. It is academics and uh, you would expect me to say it's academics. So don't mishear me and, and uh, think I'm saying, oh, we don't care about uh, them optimizing their academic abilities. But being successful in life, how you measure success in life, is so many other things beyond uh, whether or not you can do differential calculus. So I think uh, these sessions, I'm so pleased to see so many of you here. Uh, I'm really gratified to see that so many people have made time out of their day to come and think about this, because it's very definitely a soft subject. Um, it's that kind of thing which doesn't get reported on uh, on something that a university may ask to see uh, in order to uh, grant entrance to a student. However, we know in life that actually 
Um, you get hired on the basis of your skills and competence, uh, on your skills, sorry, and fired on the basis of your competencies. So the, the bit of paper will get you a job, uh, but who you are and how you are will get you fired. <laughs> so the reality is that what we're talking about here is intrinsic to your children's future success and happiness in whatever they do. Uh, and that, of course, it was, it was interesting just coming on, on uh, the final few questions. Um, that whole notion of negotiation, discussion, open-ended questions, a genuine interest in your child without judgment um, is crucial. Almost impossible to do, isn't it? <laughs> Almost impossible to look at something your child is doing or listen to something they're saying and not have a strong opinion uh, about it where you might say, um, no, I don't agree with that, uh, it should be this. But actually our role as parents is to um, be role models for an open mind that weighs possibilities, consequences and a process to consider which is the best outcome. And of course that's easy to say in this environment, not so easy when your child is screaming in front of you because they don't want to eat peas uh, or whatever it might be, that uh, they don't want to come off uh, their PlayStation, whatever the problem is that you're talking about. So thank you ever so much, thank you Priya uh, for giving you time and, and wisdom into this discussion and thank you very much uh, for all that you do to support your child. Of course, you know, your child's happiness is reward in, its, in itself. Um, but on behalf of the school, we're really grateful uh, that you come and invest in time to see what you can do to uh, work even better with your child as a parent. Thanks very much. Have a lovely day.